You're listening to Flaunt. Find your sparkle and create a life you love. After infidelity or betrayal, have you been betrayed by life, your body, or someone that you love? You're not alone. No matter what you've been through, Naked Self-Worth helps you regain confidence, joy, and enthusiasm so you can create a life you love and flourish. Tune in weekly and learn how. Welcome to Flaunt. Find your sparkle and create a life you love after infidelity or betrayal. I am Laura Cheadle, and today we are going to talk about perfectionism. Oh, that's a big one. That drive to be perfect, that drive to get that validation from everybody, that drive to always have the gold star to know that you're like, I am doing my best and I'm I'm doing it all. We're going to talk about that drive (laughs) because, oh my gosh, the interplay, the intersection between the drive to be perfect and self-worth and a fair recovery is huge. And while you might be thinking, well, Laura, duh, it's good to be perfect. And if I was even more perfect, things might not have turned out this way for me. What I want to say to you is... Oh my gosh, I thought that too. I thought for so many years that if I could just do a better job, if I could just keep it all together, if I could just be a better mom, be a better wife, have a better body, keep a better house, be a happier, more positive person, self-develop, like if I could do all of this stuff that my life would be better. And here's the thing. Even though I felt confident, even though I really did think I was pretty darn amazing, I really thought I was the one in the relationship who did the heavy lifting. I was the one who kept it all together. I was the one who was the primary parent. And I had a lot of pride in that, but I also felt like it was true. Even though I felt like that. And even though I really did do an excellent job, I excelled at many different things. Here's the kicker. I really didn't have that rock solid self-worth because so much of my self-worth revolved around how perfect I was. So much of my self-worth revolved around what a good mom I was, how emotionally intelligent I was, how I did everything for everyone, how I was the responsible one, how I read all the books, how I learned about all the relationships, how I self-reflected and was self-aware. And it's such a a weird double-edged sword because on the one hand, I was doing a good job. On the one hand, I was perfect in so many different ways. But on the other hand, it didn't completely translate or it translated weird because I was basing my self-worth and my self-esteem on what I did, not on who I was. And this comes up so often with the women that I coach. So often. Because it's so common for so many of us to think that if we just do it right, then we'll get rewarded. If we just do a better job, then things will work out. I want you to go back to your childhood. I want you to go back to the messages that you got from your family, from your school, from your community from TV, from literature, from your friends. Everything that we're told is to to make other people happy, to be a good girl, to do things right, to make other people proud. And that when we do, we will be rewarded. Be the good one in class. Be teacher's pet. Be the good one at home. Make mommy and daddy happy. Make grandma and grandpa proud. Be the good friend who shows up, who helps. 
We're taught that. We are conditioned to make other people happy. And we are promised this false reward. We are promised that when we make other people happy, we will be rewarded. Here's the syllabus. When you meet everything that's on the syllabus, you'll get a good grade. You start dating somebody, here's, and they tell you, here's what I want in a partner. And what do we do? We say, I can do that. They say, I want someone with long hair, not short hair. And you say, I can grow my hair. They say, I like someone who wears skirts instead of pants. What do you do? You invest in more skirts. They say, I want someone who is an excellent cook. You learn how to cook. They say, I want somebody who, whatever it is, we lean in. I can do that. And here's the thing. On the one hand, there's nothing wrong with that. But on the other hand, there's everything wrong with that. Because while it's nice to be collaborative, while it's nice to be con- connected, while it's really nice to do what we can to get along, to make other people happy. Really, the relevant question, though, is what about you? What do you want? If somebody says to you when you're dating, I love somebody to wear skirts, not pants, and you think, I've always loved skirts. That's always been who I am, and that's what I love it more. And isn't this wonderful that we both we both really like this, and now I can lean into my feminine flirty side or whatever it is? That's great. But if you think, oh my God, I hate wearing skirts. I, I love pants. It's, it protects like the inside of my thighs, and I can bend down, and I don't have to worry about it, and I'm so much more comfortable then your response really should be to speak your truth. Wow, that's that's great information. I cannot stand skirts. They blow up. I have to be careful. My thighs rub together and it's really uncomfortable. Speak your truth. And it's not like you have to say to somebody, hey, it's either me or skirts, ultimatum, blah, 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 blah. It's not like that. It's just knowing who you are and knowing what you want and being able to communicate that to somebody else too. Because in the skirts versus pants example, which I know is a frivolous, silly little example, it's just an example because that's how it starts. It starts with these silly little frivolous things. And then before we know it, it snowballs and we're compromising in our whole life and we are tolerating all of the stuff that we shouldn't be tolerating. So to carry the skirts example further, so you're going out for somebody's birthday and they really want you to wear a skirt. And even though it's not your thing, you're like, I can wear a skirt to dinner because I know it really makes you happy. And then they know that you're wearing a skirt to make them happy and it means more to them because they know you're making this tiny little sacrifice for them. And they're like, oh my gosh, that means so much to me. Thank you so much for doing that. That, that is wonderful. And you know you have bent over backwards for them. And they know you have bent over backwards for them. And then you're all on the same page and you've got all this appreciation going back and forth for each other. And they're like, I appreciate you. And you're like, I appreciate you. And it feels really good. So those are the positive ways. Those are the right ways that we seek to please another person. But so often, too often, we get stuck in thinking that our job is to please somebody else. When in reality, our job is to please our self. I'm going to say that again. Our job in life is to please our self. And before you push back on me and say, but Laura, I am not selfish. I'm so tired of selfish people in the world and I am not selfish, blah, 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 blah. What I want to say to you is I get what you're saying and pleasing yourself is not selfish. Being the best that you can be is not selfish. Yes, I get it if you have 
young kids at home who need you. You can't always go out and do everything that you want in that moment. But I also know The modeling for your kids, how to take care of yourself and how to please yourself first is healthy. Think about your child going out on a date and ending up in a date rape situation because they just want to please the other person and they feel bad because the other person spent money on dinner and the other person has done all these nice things for them and they feel like they owe them and they feel like their job is to please them. Not the situation you want your kids in thinking, well, I've just got to please them. Same thing in the workforce or at school or in life. If somebody's doing something that is slightly not quite ethical or even legal, don't you want to raise your kids to have enough self-respect and self-esteem and self-worth that they can say, I'm not comfortable with that and move on versus wanting to please their friends, wanting to be liked, succumbing to peer pressure and ending up in a situation that is very harmful. It all spirals back down, all that perfectionism to self-worth. And why it is so hard to spot is so often the perfectionists really do appear to be very confident, very together people because they're doing it right. They're successful. And you might be looking at yourself thinking, I don't have a self-worth problem. Look at me. I'm, you know, fill in the blank. Successful, I'm educated, I'm powerful, I'm a go getter, I'm whatever it is, I'm perfect. I do everything in my power to be perfect all the time. And you might even be thinking, it's not that I try to be perfect, it's just that I do a really good job at things. I'm sure you do. I do too. (laughs) But what I'm asking you to do is take that a little bit deeper. Take it a little bit deeper. And here's kind of the kicker on that. The hallmark of true self-worth. The hallmark of rock solid self-esteem and self-worth is knowing with every fiber of your being that you are worthy of screwing up big time. The hallmark of self-worth and self-esteem is knowing that you are worthy of messing it all up, making huge mistakes. And that might come as kind of a jarring revelation. Because we live in this world where false A false sense of self, a false sense of esteem is really touted. Where we're like, yeah, I'm worthy of spending $10,000 on a handbag. I'm worthy of going into debt to buy this car. I'm worthy of... And then it's all of these things that prop us up. I'm worthy of designer clothes. I'm worthy of fancy vacations. I'm worthy of having the house that I want, the shoes that I want. I'm worthy of that. That's not self-worth. True self-worth is I am worthy to mess it up. I am worthy to be ugly and broken. I am worthy of making mistakes and losing money and not knowing what I'm doing and having to go back and figure it out again. I'm worthy of the ugliness in my heart and in my life and in my surroundings. And that is the hallmark of true self-worth. When you know that you are worthy of messing up. And while you're breathing through that, and while you're going, 
oh my God, Laura, this is just, ah, I don't know what you're saying. I don't want to be icky. I don't want to be messy. That's the whole point. I don't make mistakes. I think it through. I educate myself. I talk to people. I get coaching. I get counseling. I get, I don't make mistakes. But what I want to say to you is, that's what I'm talking about. Why do you do that? Well, if you're anything like me, you do it because you don't want to make mistakes. You don't want to screw up your kid's life. You don't want to screw up your marriage. You don't want to, you don't want to lose your job. You don't want to lose money. You don't want to be homeless. You don't like, you don't want all of these things. So you quote unquote do the right thing, right? And there's nothing wrong with doing the right thing. And there's nothing wrong with trying to do a stellar job. The problem is when your identity rests on, I am the kind of person who leans in. I am the kind of person who does the right thing for the right reason. I am the kind of person who doesn't mess up. Because let me tell you, everybody messes up. And a lot of people try. And a lot of people mess up anyway because they don't know the future. Because trying and doing the right thing doesn't always turn out. And it's when you can really sit with yourself and be okay. We've all heard this. It's okay to not be okay. It is okay to not be okay. But it's more than that. It's okay to love yourself as you're not being okay. It's okay to make really big mistakes. It's okay to screw up really bad. But what matters is that you love yourself through it, that you are completely accepting of yourself in your worst moments, because it's not hard to be accepting of yourself in your good moments. It's not hard to love yourself when you're all pulled together and have your makeup and your hair and your clothes and your designer bag and your shoes. And that's not hard. But it is hard to love yourself when you're falling apart. And that's what self-worth is all about. And a phrase that I have used, it's a phrase that I use in my book. If you have not read my book, I highly, highly recommend it. Because it's going to help you with this whole self-worth thing. It's going to help you get that unshakable sense of self. My book is called Flaunt. Drop your cover and reveal your smart, sexy, and spiritual self. It's published by New World Library, and you can get it anywhere books are sold. You can even get it on Target and Walmart. You can get it on Barnes & Noble. Of course, you can get it on Amazon. You can get anything on Amazon. You can get it on New World Library's website. You can get it literally anywhere books are sold. And yes, it's available in the paperback or the audiobook edition. But what I talk about in that book is the term naked self-worth. And no, it's not about being metaphorically naked, but it's about accepting yourself metaphorically naked. Because what do we do every day? And I'm not knocking this because let me tell you, I put on makeup and I do my hair and I, I'm concerned about my clothing and I've got foundation garments. Like I've got all that too. But what do we do every day? We get up, we do our hair, we do our makeup, we put on our clothes, especially if we're going to go out and see people, we gussy up. And like I said, there's nothing wrong with that. But then we have a certain amount of confidence because I'm in my red jacket and I feel confident. I've got great hair. I'm having a good hair day and I feel really confident. Got my lipstick on. I'm looking good. I'm feeling good. And then we go out and we face the world and we smile and we project and we emit this confidence because we know we look good because we've taken care of it. We've gotten the blowout. We've done whatever it is. But how are you going to act and how are you going to behave if you roll out of bed 
after puking all night because you ate something bad and your hair's a mess, and even though you've brushed your teeth, it still feels just blah, and you didn't have it in you to put on any kind of makeup, to put on anything with a waistband because your stomach is still tender, and you just, you look a mess. You've hopped in the shower, you just kind of drip dried, towel dried your hair, you head to the store, you run into people. Are you going to project and emit the same level of confidence as if you've gotten ready and prepared for the day? No, you're not. And yes, in the little scenario I gave, you didn't feel that great. So, I understand that. But the point is, how can you be confident enough to project that same level of energy and enthusiasm? How can you be confident enough to admit that you know that you are worthy, even though you look like that? What I talk about when I talk about naked self-worth is literally the ability to love yourself and value yourself for who you are, metaphorically naked. Like, none of us like ourselves naked. (laughs) We just don't. So how can you stand there naked and be just as confident as you are all gussied up? That's the kind of self-worth that I'm talking about. How can you stand there confident in an outfit from Walmart and a bad car and a cheap handbag, it's it's getting rid of all those extraneous things. Your title, your label, your things, your paycheck, your kids, like all of the things that you value in yourself. It's great and it's good to be proud of all those things. But at some point, that confidence lies within you. And the only person that can validate you is you. I do a lot of things to take care of myself, to help me go to the next level. And one of the things that I do for other people, if you're coaching with me, you're going to get some energy work. If you're coaching with me, you're going to get hypnosis. You're going to get meditation. You're going to get movement. You're going to get all of these different things because I am a big believer in the idea that growth happens on all levels. I'll come back to the story of me and energy work and why this matters, but I'm going to take a moment to talk about what it looks like when you coach with me. And if you want some more information, go to Affair Recovery for Women, AffairRecoveryForWomen.com. And you can look at all of the stuff, but it's just AffairRecoveryForWomen.com. And there's a quick rundown of my bespoke coaching package. And then if you're interested, you can click the little button and you can schedule a half hour conversation with me and we can talk about what it would look like for you. But when I work with people, it's not just coaching. We're not just talking about what happened to you. I'm not just telling you what I did and giving you solutions. We are targeting it on all levels. We are going deep on your self-worth, on your self-esteem, and we are teaching you to validate yourself first and foremost. We are breaking you out of that conditioned pattern to please everybody else in your life, to go for the gold star so somebody else can reward you. And we are teaching you how to validate yourself first. And before you can learn how to validate yourself, you have to figure out who you are and what you want. And we do all that too. And we don't just talk about it in theory. We don't just say, I want to do this and I want to do this and good job. I got this done. We go deep in it. We take it on all levels. Spiritually, what are you here for? What is your divine blueprint? What is your mission in life? Why did you go through this infidelity journey? You went through this for a reason. Let's unpack that and let's do something with it. Let's heal your energy field. 
Have you ever felt like you see maybe the affair partner or you look at a calendar and there's a date and you're like, ah, and you have that charge, that jerk. "Ah!" That's your energy field. And as long as your energy field is still charged, is still triggered, you're not healed. So we do energy work to help recalibrate your energy field, to help calm those triggers. We work in the spiritual plane. We work in the energetic plane. We use hypnosis to change the way that your brain processes information. To change the way you handle life and experiences. To tame the way you experience and remember and process the trauma of infidelity. We work on that cognitive level. We work on all levels to change you and to make you grounded in yourself and your truth. Because until you know who you are and what your truth is, until you break out of that need to please other people, to conform to society's expectations of what you should and shouldn't do, and until we break you out of constantly performing life, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to smile through this, until you break away from the needs to please conform and perform and really get in touch and ground with yourself and ground into who you are and what you are worth. Until that happens, you are always going to be rocked by life's storms. Until that happens, you're not going to be able to fully heal because you're not able to validate yourself And you're not able to truly feel worthy of everything that you want and believe and are, including the freedom to make mistakes, the freedom to mess up royally, and to still unconditionally love and Accept yourself. So affairrecoveryforwomen.com. That's just an overview. That's just the highlight. Book an appointment with me. We'll talk about what it looks like for your specific circumstance. Because again, it's a bespoke, customized package. Because we all need different things. We're all coming into this in different places. And our circumstances are all different. So why I started down this path was because I take care of myself. I will always take care of myself. And one of the ways that I take care of myself is I get energy work. I still see therapists. I have a coach. I do all of these things too. And you know what? I always will. Not that I will always do each and everything, but I will always be leveling up. And I will always be seeking the support that I need to get to that next level because I really know that I am worth that. And I am worth knowing that I don't know. I am worth, I'm okay if I don't know how to do like taxes or some sort of financial planning or strategy or business strategy or something like that. I love and accept myself, even though I don't know how to do that. And then I hire the help that I need to get it done. And it's not a shame thing. It's not that, oh God, you should get better at financial planning and you should get better at doing your own taxes. And you should, I am worthy of not knowing how to do my taxes. I am worthy of being stinky at business strategy, whatever it is. I love and accept myself as I am. I know where I need help and then I seek it out. And then sometimes I take a break from things and I go on for a while 
And then I realize I'm lacking here. I can't do this on my own. And I don't deserve to have to do it on my own. And it's not a fearful shame thing to go get help. When I'm stuck, I know I'm stuck. Do I need an energy healer, a counselor, a coach? What do I need? Do I need time away? What do I need to get me through this? So one of the things that I love is energy healing and energy work. And I have been working with a brilliant energy healer, and she was a guest on my show, oh goodness, about a year ago. I should probably link her show in the show notes because you will find her work phenomenal. But we were talking about overwhelm, the idea of overwhelm, and why I fall into overwhelm, because that's what I was feeling. I was feeling like there's so much I need to do, and there's so many decisions I need to make, And I just can't get this all done. And it was like, I don't need to be in that feeling of overwhelm. And as we started talking about it, the things that came up were first perfection. I need to do it right. I need to have everything done perfectly. And then came the question, why? Why do you need to have it done perfectly? And what came out were, all of these beliefs in my head about if you're going to do something, you know, don't, if, if, you, if you can't do it right, don't do it at all. And this belief that you have to get the A. You have to get the A. You have to be the best in class. It has to be the best blog, the best book, the best podcast, the best whatever it is. Okay, why? Why does it have to be the best? See how you keep asking yourself that next question, going deep into that next layer? Because then people will appreciate me. Because then people will love me. Because then people will listen to my podcast and they'll give me a positive review. And then other people will see that positive review. And then they will listen to the podcast and then they will like it and then they will give me a positive review. And then I'll see those reviews and I'll feel so good about myself. Wow. What happened to just being proud of my podcast myself? What happened to just recording an an episode and me knowing that it was powerful because it felt powerful to me? What about me just feeling like, wow, I got that out into the world and that's, that's going to help people and I'm proud of myself. And if it doesn't help people, I'm still proud of myself because I said hard things and I did it. And it was like, wow, that's a lot to think about. What if I'm enough? What if my satisfaction with myself is enough? And when I was in the energy session, I connect with my guides. I I, I connect with my angels. I hear things. I, I sense things. I get messages for myself. And what I got was an image of the cake and the icing. And you know the phrase, that's just icing on the cake. The mental image I got, the understanding that I got, was validating ourselves, being proud of who we are and what we do, is the cake. We have to live life for ourselves. We have to make decisions that make us happy. That's the cake. That is being the cake. If I want to paint my walls hot pink and I paint them and I love them, I get to validate that for me. If I write a book or do a podcast or work with a client in a coaching session and I feel really, really powerful and really, really good, 
That's what it's about. If I want to stay with my husband or leave my husband, if I want to do something with or for my kids, if I want to wear a certain outfit, if I want to become somebody, if I want to pursue a career, if I want to make an investment, anything that I do, I need to do it because it makes me happy. And I need to acknowledge and feel that happiness. And I need to let that be enough. Because it is enough and because that is where we are missing out. If you're in school and you take a class and you get a D minus, but you learned that information, you process that information, you have become a different person because of that information. That's what matters. It doesn't matter if you can't pass the test. It doesn't matter if you don't want to take the test. What matters is your change in understanding for you. What matters is your takeaway. If you go up until the last class and don't take the last class and don't get your certification, it's not the certification that matters. It's your acquisition of the knowledge that matters. And that is so backwards from the way that so many of us do it. We do it for the certificate. We do it for the grade. We do it for the whatever it is. And that's the icing. That's the secondary thing. If I take a new course and I get the material and I appreciate it, that's the cake. If I get a certificate, that's the icing. If I make a decision about my life, myself, my body, the way I express, the way, the things that I want, the career that I choose, the friends that I have, that's the cake. If I make my parents happy, my partner happy, my kids happy, my boss happy, that's the icing. Great. Awesome. The cake is what matters. Making you happy. Bonus. But a layer of icing with no cake is nothing. A layer of icing with no cake is meaningless. And it doesn't have form and it can't last. So my question to you is, are you the cake or are you the icing? Are the actions and decisions and the choices that you're making going to build up the cake? Or are they going to build up the icing? Because if you're anything like me, you can look back over your life and be like, oh my gosh, (laughs) I was so focused on the icing. I was focused on getting my 4.0 GPA. I was focused on being top of the class. I was focused on competing and winning. I was focused on all of these things that would give me validation from others. I wanted other people to say, Lori, you're such a great mom. I wanted people to say, look at how hard you're trying. I wanted people to say, you always are so pulled together. I wanted people to say, your house is always so clean. I wanted that external validation. And it's not that there's anything wrong with that. It's the icing. But unless you have the cake, unless you know firmly that, hey, I am a good mom. And as a good mom, it's okay that I make mistakes. It's okay that I lose my temper. It's okay that I push my kids to do something that I think is good and it ends up blowing up in everybody's face. I'm worthy of making mistakes and it's okay. I look good no matter if I gain 10 extra pounds or not. I look good whether I'm in my sweats and sweatpants or I'm really pulled together. 
I look good whether I have a hat on or I've really done my hair. Because I validate myself in any of those moments. I am good and I am appropriate. And I am doing the best that I can in every moment. And I'm not going to apologize that my house is messy. My house is a disaster zone right now. I'm painting. And when we had the painter come over a week ago to help, I'm doing some of the painting. My mom and I are doing the wallpapering. And then the painter is doing some of the detail work. And do you know what I heard myself saying when the painter got there? I heard myself saying, I'm sorry it's such a mess in here. I've been painting and wallpapering and everything is totally falling apart. And I thought, listen to you, Laura, you just made him an excuse. You just explained away why your house is messy. A, the painter doesn't care. If the painter cares, I don't care. It's nothing to me. The excuse was for me because somehow I didn't feel worthy if my house wasn't clean and put together, that there was a part of me that thought I care about the painter's judgment. Like, wait, what? I'm an amazing human being doing amazing things, and I've been through an amazingly difficult, challenging experience, and I've survived and I've thrived. And isn't that enough? And I'm painting my house and I know that when the furniture is all pulled back and things aren't tossed all over, it's going to look great and I'm going to be happy. Why isn't that enough for me? Wow. Somehow my self-worth was tied to how my house looked. That's really interesting. Really interesting. And then on the positive side, when my mom and I were wallpapering, we're putting in this really cool wallpaper, by the way. It looks like beadboard. Beadboard is like, how to even describe it? It's like that kind of wood that you put up like halfway on the bottom. It's not like paneling. It's like thin paneling. Expensive and hard to put up if you put up the really thick stuff, like the real wooden stuff. But this is wallpaper that looks like beadboard. And it looks so cool. And it's been so much fun. And we've been putting it up. And my house desperately needs a remodel. That's a whole other story, but ever since, you know, the whole affair recovery thing, I've been slowly getting rid of everything and redoing it because I feel like my environment needs to be different. I got a new bed (laughs) right after the whole affair recovery thing. I got new dishes. There were just things where I was like, I need to update some things. And because I don't have unlimited money and unlimited resources and time, obviously it takes a while to do that. And now, several years later, I'm finally getting around to doing some of the repainting and redecorating and remodeling. But it's all a part of that. It's all part of that fresh start. And having a psychological fresh start is hugely important. And here's the thing, I'm worth that. I'm also worth being able to wait I'm worthy of having it, and I'm worthy of having of waiting. It's all good. Anyway, when I was doing the wallpapering with my mom, she shared a story of a friend who said, when she found out about my situation, I just don't know if I can respect Laura anymore for staying with Sean. And it didn't phase me at all. My first thought was, how sad for you. How sad for you? Like, your respect, I don't care about because it doesn't change who I am. It doesn't change who I am. And it didn't face me at all. And that self worth, that self worth, I know that your opinion of me doesn't change who I am. In going back to the energy work that I've been having done lately, Because again, I take care of myself because I'm worthy of that. I'm worthy of falling apart. I'm worthy of getting insecure. I'm worthy of getting triggered and getting tripped up in my own thoughts. And I'm worthy of fixing myself and of getting the help that I need to feel better about myself. Because self-worth isn't something that you just have once and then you keep forever. 
It's like brushing your teeth. You can't say, I brushed my teeth once. Good for you. Got to do it again. Got to shower more than once in your life too. You got to work on that self-worth. Because life kind of knocks us down. And you've got to know what it is. You've got to know what it is to be the cake. And then when you realize you're focusing on the icing, you need to do whatever it takes to help you get back into being the cake. So anyway. When I was having that energy work done and I was visualizing the cake and the frosting and all of that, I also had this amazing visualization of the cake being a constellation in the sky. And it was like the the traditional birthday cake, you know, the round cake and with all the candles around it. And I got that visual and I'm like, oh my God, it's a cake constellation in the sky. Be the cake, be the cake. Be the cake. And it's this constellation. And the message around that was to be the constellation. That as the constellation, I'm big and I'm bright. And I don't dim myself and I don't fold in. I am. I am the cake. And if you don't think that I am, it doesn't change me. If you don't think that I'm worthy, it doesn't change me. If you don't think that I'm perfect, it doesn't change me. If you think that I'm perfect, it doesn't change me. Literally what anybody else thinks or doesn't think doesn't change me. Me as a constellation, me as the cake constellation cannot be changed. I am who I am. I am who I am, and I am worthy of being who I am, good and bad and everything in between. So my challenge to you is to take an inventory of your life. Where do you feel like you need to be perfect? Where do you feel like you need to please other people? Where do you feel like it's your job to please other people? Where do you feel like it's your job to make other people happy? Oh my gosh, it is not. Where are you focusing on the icing? Where are you focusing on all of that external stuff? And then where are you the cake? And it's okay if you're like I used to be where you kind of go, oh my gosh. I don't even know what it's like to be the cake. I don't even know what it means to make myself happy. Because I've never given myself the opportunity to feel into that. I want you to start small. Make a meal. See if you enjoy the process of cooking. See if you enjoy the the meal that you made. Create a beautiful evening for yourself. Maybe it's a bubble bath or a shower. Maybe it's, you know, reading or music or lighting a candle or having tea. Create something that you enjoy and feel yourself enjoy it. Feel yourself enjoy the experience. Set out to do something that you want to do and then notice that you've done it. Like I mentioned, I'm painting and I'm wallpapering. I look at the wall that I've just painted, whether it's perfect or not perfect. And I can really appreciate what I'm doing. Sometimes corners are hard. Sometimes it's not perfect. Sometimes there's a drip in the paint. And I still validate and appreciate myself because look at all this fun stuff that I did. Look at how I've transformed this room. Even though there's a drip in the paint or whatever, look at how I've transformed this room. If you're not on my email list, you should be. (laughs) How to get on my email list is 
you can go to my website. You can get your free Betrayal Recovery Guide. You can go to betrayalrecoveryguide.com. You can download your guide. You can put in your email and then you'll be on my list and you will get five emails every couple days that will walk you through a betrayal recovery sequence. It will tell you a little bit about my story, about my transformation, and it will give you a lot of tips and tricks that will help you through yours. But the reason that I mention that and the reason that I bring it up is I enjoyed writing the story. I enjoyed thinking about talking to you. I thought about our connection. I thought about what I wanted to share about myself so you could get to know me. I thought about what the tips were that I wanted to give you, and I wrote them from the heart. And then I got them all, you know, set up in my little email scheduler. And then I had some people reach out and be like, there's a typo. And they'd be like, oh, thank you. That's awesome. And you know what? I didn't care (laughs) enough to correct it. And what I mean by I didn't care enough to correct it is it's not that I don't think you deserve perfect emails. But it was one of those things that I thought, you know what? I'm writing from the heart and I'm really proud about what I said in my story. And sometimes when there's a dropped letter or a typo, I'm still okay with it. And one of these days I'll get around to it but I'm still proud of what I did and they still serve their purpose. And if you're offended by them, you're the one that's offended, not me because it doesn't change the fact that I was still proud of them and I still worked really hard and I still thought about the content and I still think it's going to help you and change you. And that's how I am with all of my work. It's my intention and my belief that it will help you and that it will change you. And that you will transform and that you will become stronger and more confident. And I'm okay with the mistakes that I make in that. Sometimes there's a typo. Sometimes a word gets dropped or whatever. And I'm okay with that because it doesn't change me. It doesn't change the good that comes through it. I'm worthy of making mistakes. I'll go back through and I'll fix them. It's not that I want to be sloppy about them. But I'm okay with it. It's not a panic. And that's what I want for you. What I want for you is the ability to be okay with who you are and how you are, whether it is perfect or whether it's far from perfect and it is a hot mess or whether it's anything in between. What I want for you is for you to be the cake. Be the cake. Validate yourself in all of your messy imperfection. I can't wait to connect with you. To hear what it means for you to be the cake. And to help you move into that state of worthiness where you know that you are worthy of being completely messy. So reach out affairrecoveryforwomen.com or betrayalrecoveryguide.com. Have an amazing week. I can't wait to connect. And as usual, always remember to flaunt exactly who you are because who you are is always more than enough. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Have you been struggling lately? Relationship issues impact every area of your life. When I found out about my husband's infidelity, I was so devastated. I could barely function. Sleeping was impossible because I couldn't shut off my brain. Eating was a challenge because I felt nauseous all the time. And for the first month or so, everything felt pointless. Whether you're having trouble sleeping, feeling hopeless, or just can't focus, better help is here to help you. BetterHelp offers licensed therapists who are trained to listen and help. You can talk to your therapist in a private online environment at your convenience. There's a broad range of expertise in BetterHelp's 20,000 plus therapist network that gives you access to help that might not be available in your area. 
And just fill out a questionnaire to help assess your specific needs. And then you'll be matched with a therapist in under 24 hours. And then you can schedule secure video and phone sessions. Plus, you can exchange unlimited messages. And everything you share is completely confidential. I know that confidentiality was important for me, especially early on when I couldn't even get my own mind wrapped around what was happening. And it was so comforting to be able to speak with someone candidly about everything I was going through, to validate that what I was feeling and experiencing was completely normal. You can request a new therapist at no additional charge anytime. Join the 2 million plus people who have taken charge of their mental health with an experienced BetterHelp therapist. Special offer. To flaunt, create a life you love after infidelity and betrayal listeners. You get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash flaunt. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash flaunt, F-L-A-U-N-T. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast. Tune in next time to Flaunt. Find your sparkle and create a life you love after infidelity or betrayal with radio host and live choreographer Laura Cheadle every Wednesday at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Time on syndicated Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. Develop naked self-worth and reclaim your confidence, enthusiasm, and joy so you can create a life you love and embrace who you are today. Download your free Sparkle Through Betrayal Recovery Guide at NakedSelfWorth.com.